All right, y'all, so we're back with some more strange and mysterious discoveries. This video is titled, This Boy Vanished Almost 10 Years Ago. Now the FBI have discovered the strange truth. Let's check out all this stuff. In 2021, over 500,000 missing persons were reported in the United States. And while that's just a rough statistic, and these are reports alone, a significant number of these people are never found again. However, there are times when they do show up again. And usually, their stories are quite unbelievable. From a missing five-year-old who was found again as a teenager to a woman's short disappearance, here are 20 missing people who were eventually found. Number 20. Julian Hernandez In 2002, five-year-old Julian Hernandez disappeared from his home in Alabama. The culprit? The child's own father, who left a letter claiming he took the child. Julian was never seen again until years later. For 13 years, the case remained unsolved, with investigators putting in countless hours trying to locate Julian. It was ironic, but Julian's own actions revealed he was listed as a missing child. As a teenager, Julian was applying for college when he encountered a discrepancy with his social security number. With the assistance of a school counselor, he discovered that his social security number did not match his name. This discovery mm. led them to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children database, where Julian found himself listed. Just imagine how shocked he was. That's yeah, what I was about to say, can you imagine that? You're, you're applying for college. You're applying for college and you find out you've been on a missing persons list since you were five years old? <laughs> Fam, talk about therapy. The FBI along with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and local police departments, collaborated and confirmed that the teenager found in Ohio was indeed Julian Hernandez. His father, Bobby Hernandez, was subsequently arrested and charged with tampering with records and interference with custody. However, Julian later on claimed that he had already forgiven his father. According I was to about to ask, who presses charges in this manner? Does the kid have the right to say, well, I don't want him to go to jail, or... Is it possibly, because I don't think they said it throughout the video, is it the mom? Does the mom say, no, we're, we're filing charge, we're pressing charges, I want him to go to jail. Who, who, who has to say so in this case? The teenager, he wouldn't have pushed himself to attend university had it not been for Bobby. He was raised properly by the man. Despite Julian's sentiment, Bobby was sentenced to serve four years in prison. Many claimed that no mother or parent deserves to lose their child. What's your take on this? Let me know in the comments down below. Before we go on, like this video, smash the subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now. Number 19. Robert McDonough Robert McDonough was a 73-year-old man with dementia who lived in Lemington, Maine. One Monday afternoon, McDonough suddenly went missing, and when it was reported to the police, he had already been gone for over 14 hours. The search for him was extensive involving aircraft, infrared cameras, canine units, and ATVs. And yet, despite these efforts, there was no trace of him. How he was finally found is quite unexpected, and should I say, something that seems only to happen in movies. He suddenly walked by a news report about his own disappearance. A news crew was setting up near his home to provide a live update on the search when McDonough casually strolled up to them. The reporter, Norm Carcos, initially greeted him politely, not realizing who he was. It was only after a short time that Carcos and the crew recognized him as the missing man they were reporting on. Luckily, McDonough appeared to be in relatively good health. He was a little dirty, but otherwise he didn't seem to have been badly hurt. The news crew quickly notified the main warden service, and McDonough was safely returned home. His unexpected appearance during the live news segment made for a surprising and heartwarming end to what could have been a tragic story. Number eight. That's why I often wonder, do people who have dementia, do they qualify for like those dogs that that like assist you? You know, the ones that they have for people for emotional support, they have the people for the people who are blind. I wonder, do they have like special type dogs that can assist you for people who have dementia? Team Petra Patsika. In 1984, Petra Patsika, a 24-year-old computer science student in Braunschweig, Germany, suddenly disappeared. She was last seen after visiting her dentist, and she was supposedly heading to her parents' house, but she never arrived. Her disappearance sparked a large-scale police investigation, 
and even featured on the most popular shows in the country. For years, the mystery of her disappearance remained unsolved. At some point, however, a man came forward and claimed he was responsible for Petra's death. However, he later retracted his statement. Despite extensive searches and public appeals for information, Petra remained missing, and she was officially declared dead in 1989. And so, who would have thought that 31 years after her disappearance, Petra would soon be found alive? In 2015, during a routine police response to a reported burglary in Dusseldorf, more than 200 miles away from Braunschweig, Petra was discovered, alive and well. She was living under a false name she had given herself, Mrs. Schneider, and had been doing so for decades in various cities across western Germany. To hide her identity, she kept no official documents or bank accounts and paid all her bills in cash. When asked about her disappearance, Petra did not give any explanation for her actions and expressed a desire to continue living away from the public eye and her family. The motive behind her self-imposed disappearance remains unknown. Her family, who had mourned her as dead for over three decades, were understandably shocked and emotional upon learning that she was, in fact, alive. How would you react if a family member did the same thing? Well, if there's no clear reason for why they disappeared, I'd probably be angry. Number 17. Lucy Ann Johnson Lucy, born on October 14, 1935 in Alaska, went missing from her home in Surrey, British Columbia in 1961. Despite being reported missing by her husband Marvin in May 1965, she had not been seen since September 1961. For years, her whereabouts remained a mystery, with her husband even being suspected of her murder at one point. However, no evidence was found, and the case eventually went cold. But in June 2013, almost 52 years after her disappearance, she was found. That year, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in Surrey highlighted her case as part of their Missing of the Month series. This prompted Johnson's daughter, Linda Evans, to conduct her own investigation. She placed an ad in the Yukon News, seeking information about her mother. Astonishingly, Evans received responses, including one from a woman claiming Lucy was also her mother. It was confirmed that Lucy was alive and well, living in Yukon under a different name. She had remarried and had four more children. Lucy revealed that she disappeared because of her late husband Marvin's abusive behavior and that she had attempted to take her children with her, but was not allowed to. A few months after this discovery, Evans flew to Whitehorse to reunite with her mother and meet her half-siblings. Evans, once again, expressed her desire to be part of her mother's life, despite the years lost. Well, I guess all's well that ends well. I just hope that her husband never tries to enter her life ever again. I guess it's easy for us to question at this point because we're on this side of it, but why would she never go to the police and try to get them involved in something like that? And the only thing I can think of is maybe he threatened her with the kid, saying he would do something to the kid if, if she did or something like that. Even so, you still alert them and let them know what he says so they can go about it the right way. But I, I can't just see myself walking away, not for my kids. Number 16. Elizabeth Smart Now here's a harrowing case. The kidnapping of Elizabeth Smart in 2002. At just 14 years old, Elizabeth was abducted from her home in Salt Lake City, Utah by Brian Mitchell and his wife, Wanda Barzi. During her nine-month ordeal, she was held captive on the outskirts of Salt Lake City and later in San Diego County, California. Elizabeth was subjected to repeated abuse and threats from Mitchell. She was rescued the following year after being recognized while in public with her captors. Following this traumatic experience, Elizabeth Smart has become an advocate for missing persons and victims of assault. Meanwhile, Mitchell and Barzi faced legal consequences for their actions, with Mitchell receiving a life sentence and Barzi serving 15 years in prison. They deserve to spend their time in jail, if you ask me. Yep. Number 15. J.C. Dugard on June 10, 1991, 11-year-old J.C. was abducted from a street near her home in South Lake Tahoe, California, by Philip and Nancy Garrido. J.C.'s stepfather witnessed her abduction, but couldn't intervene in time. Despite extensive searches involving dogs, aircraft, and the FBI, J.C. could not be found. Just imagine the guilt that ate away at her stepfather's sanity. Initially, he might have held himself responsible for not reaching his daughter in time. Later investigations revealed that Philip Garrido, the primary kidnapper, had a troubling criminal history. Before abducting J.C., 
he had been convicted of various crimes, including victimizing a 14-year-old girl and the assault of several other women. Despite being sentenced to 50 years in prison for one of these crimes, he served only 11 years before being released on parole, something that many believe he didn't deserve. During her 18-year captivity in Antioch, California, JC was held in a shed in the Garrido's backyard. She endured continuous abuse and gave birth to two daughters fathered by Philip Garrido. She was forced to live a life of isolation and control with limited exposure to the outside world. It wasn't until August 2009 when UC Berkeley police officers suspicious of Philip Garrido helped unravel the mystery of JC's disappearance. This led to her discovery and the arrest of the Garridos. JC's return to her family after 18 years made international news and highlighted the failures and limitations of law enforcement systems and missing person cases. JC Dugard's resilience and strength are evident in her recovery and her efforts to rebuild her life after her ordeal. She's written about her experiences in her autobiography, A Stolen Life, and a second book, Freedom, My Book of Firsts. See, this is my this is my greatest fear as as a parent. And I'm pretty sure y'all y'all feel the same way. You know, you you're out whatever. If you're out on the playground with your kid or they're in the front yard, like I, I never could turn my eye off of them and because all it took was that takes is that split second and somebody walk past and just grab your kid and just take off. You know, it always made me nervous. Therefore, I could not be far away. I couldn't not have my eyes on them. I could not be in with arms and within arm's reach. I guess I had done scared myself up so much that no, no, because a lot of times that's how this happens, man. You just, you t for whatever reason, you turn and look away for a minute and your kid even wanders off or somebody snatches them up and it's, and then you're stuck blaming yourself because that's what I would do. I'd be blaming myself. Sharing her journey from captivity to freedom and adjusting to a new life. Number 14. Lula Gillespie Miller In 1974, Lula Ann Gillespie Miller, a mother of three from Indiana, went missing shortly after giving birth to her third child. But unlike other disappearances, Lula went missing intentionally. At the age of 28, feeling too young to be a mother, she signed away custody of her children to her parents and left home. Her family received a letter postmarked from Richmond, Indiana in 1975, which was the last time they heard from her. For decades, her whereabouts remained a mystery. But Gillespie Miller was found alive in Texas in 2016, living under a false name. This discovery came about after Indiana State Police Detective Sergeant Scott Jarvis took on her case in January 2014, following a request from the Doe Network, a volunteer organization that assists in missing persons investigations. The detective had initially arranged for a body buried in an unmarked grave to be exhumed for DNA analysis, believing it might be Gillespie Miller. However, while this was underway, Sergeant Jarvis followed the trail of a woman with similarities to Gillespie Miller eventually finding her in Texas. Gillespie Miller admitted her identity when Sergeant Jarvis approached her, and although she had not committed a crime, she had chosen to keep her identity secret. Her daughter, Tammy Miller, whom she had never known, was informed of her mother's discovery and hoped to speak to her. Well, no one deserves to be ghosted by their mother, and I hope Tammy found her peace. Number 13. And unfortunately, a lot of kids do this to their parents, man. And as a parent, you're thinking, oh, I've raised my kids. I've gotten to the end of the finish line. I, I can live my life, retire, and live it up. Nope, your kids drop kids at your doorstep and leave and say they can't handle it. Like, oh boy. You know, I'm not saying you don't love your grandkids, but man, this is like hitting a reset button. Edgar Latulip. In 1986, at the age of 21, Edgar Latulip disappeared from Kitchener, Ontario, Canada. He had been receiving treatment at a hospital after a severe incident, but when attendants checked in on him, he was gone. It's believed that he boarded a bus to Niagara Falls, but he suffered a head injury along the way, which resulted in amnesia. This injury caused him to forget his identity, leading him to create a new life for himself, unaware that his family had been searching for him. For 30 years, the tulip lived just 80 miles from his family, maintaining a low profile without any use of social media and at times struggling with homelessness. In 2016, however, Latulip began remembering parts of his life. He informed his social worker that he believed his real name was Edgar Latulip, 
This led to an internet search, revealing that Edgar LaTulip had been missing for 30 years. LaTulip's identity was confirmed through a DNA test, which matched a sample provided by his mother, Sylvia Wilson. His mother had for years feared that her son, who has a mental age of 12, had been abused or even murdered because of his developmental disorder. Upon discovering that her son was alive and well, Wilson felt overwhelmed and excited at the prospect of seeing him again. The Niagara Police Department and local community partners worked to reunite them. Number 12. Carlina White Born in Harlem, New York City in 1987, Carlina White was abducted from the hospital at just 19 days old. Yes, you heard that right. She was raised by Anagetta Ann Petway in Bridgeport, Connecticut, under the name Nedra Nettie Nance, unaware of her true identity. Suspicion about her true identity arose during her teens, especially when Petway could not provide a birth certificate. This suspicion grew when White became pregnant in 2005 and needed her birth certificate for health insurance. Petway provided a forged document, which officials identified as such, leading to Petway's confession that she was not White's biological mother. White began searching for her true identity, leading her to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children's website. There, she found a photo of a baby kidnapped in 1987 who looked similar to her and her infant daughter. This discovery eventually led her to her biological parents, and DNA testing in 2011 confirmed that she was indeed their missing daughter, mm. Carlina White. The reunion with her biological parents, Joy White and Carl Tyson, was an emotional one. White struggled to navigate her new life and relationships, having lived a lie for so many years. Despite the challenges, she is reconnected with her biological parents while also acknowledging the affection she feels for Petway, who raised her for the first 23 years of her life. Petway turned herself in to the FBI in January 2011 and later pleaded guilty to federal kidnapping charges. How do you just wake up and be like, you know what, I'm going to take somebody else's child, you know? Yeah, I'm, that's that's what that's what I feel like doing today. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna go to. How do you do that? How do, how does that like what what operates in your brain or goes off in your brain that tells you to do that and thinks this is gonna go well for you and you do it for over two decades? Like I just don't get it, man. Where is the disconnect in people's brains? And morally, how could you do that to somebody, man? I can imagine what that mom and dad went through. They never even got a chance. Look how much stuff they missed out on. You took them, you, you took the child from day one. They were still in the hospital. She was sentenced to 12 years in prison for her crime. Carlina, now legally named Carlina White, but still goes by Nettie, speaks of feeling complete after discovering her true identity and origins. Number 11. Casey Hathaway Now here's quite a spooky case. Casey Hathaway, a three-year-old child, went missing in the wilderness. And yet, he was found alive after three days. This meant a young boy endured the harsh wilderness of Craven County, North Carolina. Despite the cold and rain, Casey survived. And he even shared how he did. He claimed a bear kept him company in the woods. A bear in the woods and there's no evidence to confirm the presence of said animal in the area. What's more bizarre is that the authorities conducted an intense search operation involving helicopters, drones, canine units, and numerous volunteers, and yet they didn't see Casey. It was considered a miracle when on the third day, rescuers found him after hearing his calls for his mother. To this day, we're still unsure what exactly happened to Casey while he was in the woods. And was that bear really a bear, or was it something else? Number 10. Catherine Van Alst In the summer of 1946, at Devil's Den State Park in Arkansas, a family's camping trip took an unexpected turn. The Van Alst family was enjoying their time outdoors when something strange happened. Their eight-year-old daughter, Catherine, was playing near a creek, and suddenly, she wasn't there anymore. One minute, she was with her brothers. The next, she had vanished. The park was vast, a 2,500-acre area with dense forests and rugged terrain. The family searched, calling for Catherine, but there was no response. They alerted park officials, and a large search began. Everyone was worried because Catherine was only in her bathing suit, not dressed for a night in the woods, let alone several days. For six days, search teams scoured the park. Six. The situation seemed dire, but then 
Something remarkable happened. Near a cave, some volunteers found Catherine. She was calm, almost unusually so, and said, Here I am. The place where she was found had been searched before, making her sudden appearance even more puzzling. What's really intriguing is how Catherine managed to survive and travel such a distance under challenging conditions. She walked over rough terrain, through forests, all while barefoot. She had some scratches and bug bites, but was otherwise okay. She told the searchers she ate berries and slept in a cave near a spring, which helped her stay hydrated. Catherine couldn't remember much about her time lost. She said she tried calling out to searchers and saw the search dogs, but was too scared to approach them. This case has led to a lot of speculation. Some people think there might be more to the story, like supernatural elements, considering the area's history and local legends. Number 9. Carlos de Salazar In 1996, Dr. Carlos de Salazar suddenly disappeared from his home in Seville, Spain, amid a severe bout of depression. For years, his family searched for him to no avail. Eventually, Spanish authorities declared him dead in 2010. However, this was not the end of Carlos' story. Almost two decades later, Carlos was unexpectedly found alive. He was discovered by a pair of mushroom pickers in a forest near Scarlino, a small town in Tuscany, Italy. They came across a man with a dirty face and large beard, who introduced himself as Carlos and revealed that he had been living in the forest for 20 years. The mushroom pickers took a photo of his worn-out expired passport, which they used to confirm his identity. The surprising news reached his family, who had believed him to be dead for years. Carlos' family, upon seeing the photo of his passport, recognized him immediately. Overwhelmed with emotions, they expressed their desire to see him, respecting his choice of solitude but longing for a reunion. The family joined a search party to locate Carlos' camp, but by the time they arrived, he had already moved to another location. His current whereabouts remain unknown. Number 8. Steve Carter Steve Carter, at 35 years old, discovered a shocking truth about his past. He knew he was adopted as a child in Honolulu, Hawaii, but details about his early life were unclear. Prompted by a TV program about a missing child, Carter checked the MissingKids.com website. There, he found an age progression image of himself, revealing that he was actually a missing child named Mark's Panama Moriarty Barnes. Carter's biological mother, Charlotte Moriarty, had taken him for a walk as a baby, abandoning him in an orphanage under a different mm. name. Carter was able to locate his biological father, Mark Barnes, who had reported his son missing years ago. This discovery made Carter reconsider his family history, especially as he contemplated starting his own family. Number 7. Savannah Todd Savannah Todd, who grew up as Samantha Geldenheis, is the daughter of Dorothy Lee Barnett. In 1994, amidst a custody battle with Savannah's biological father, Harris Todd, Barnett kidnapped Savannah, leading to a life on the run. The dramatic turn of events began during Barnett's divorce and custody dispute. She fled with her then 11-month-old daughter from the Charleston, South Carolina home. Barnett used fake documents to travel internationally, spending time in countries like Germany, France, Malaysia, and Singapore. Eventually, Dorothy Lee and Savannah settled in South Africa, where Dorothy Lee married an engineering geologist named Juan Geldenheis, and they had a son named Reese. Savannah, known as Samantha during this time, believed Geldenheis to be her father. The family later moved to Australia, where they lived on the Sunshine Coast. Her mother's past caught up with her in 2013 when she was arrested in Queensland, Australia, following a tip-off to Harris Todd by an Australian couple who knew Dorothy Lee and Savannah as Alex and Samantha. This revelation shocked Savannah, who was studying nursing at university at the time. Savannah Todd, now known as Samantha Geldenheis, lives in Australia, where she works as a nurse. She's expressed strong support for her mother despite learning about her past under dramatic circumstances. Samantha eventually met her biological father, Harris Todd, and described the experience as surreal but positive. However, they did not maintain a close relationship following their first meeting. Samantha married in 2019 in Fiji, a location chosen so that her mother, who was denied a visa to Australia after her release from prison, could attend the wedding. Number six. You robbed that man. You straight up robbed that man of all his years with his daughter. And now when they come together and finally do meet, it's hard. It's, it's, it's tough. It ain't like you could just pick up where you left off. 
No, it's tough. You got to build this relationship. And that's hard to do. And that's foul, bro. Like, it's some sick people in the world, man. Like, and, and the stuff I'm thinking in my head that needs to happen to them, I can't say on this platform. I'm telling you, bro. My, I'm thinking of some crazy stuff because this is foul. Some of the things I'm hearing that people do. And we hear about uh, parents running off with custody from the other parent more often than not. We hear this a lot. Why is that? Timothy Carney. In 2004, Timothy Carney, a 25-year-old from Butler, New Jersey, mysteriously vanished on his way to a church meeting. Born to Ed and Phyllis Carney, Timothy was a Montclair State University graduate and an English major deeply involved with the Gospel Outreach Church. Employed at the Department of Labor, he lived with a roommate and was known for his increasing dedication to his church. This dedication often led to financial constraints, as he donated a significant portion of his salary to the church. On the morning of his disappearance, he left his apartment early, but never reached his destination. His car was later found abandoned, and mysterious ATM withdrawals were made from his account. The Gospel Outreach Church, accused of cult-like practices in a lawsuit by a former member, denied any involvement in Timothy's disappearance. Seven years later, in 2011, Timothy was found alive, but chose not to disclose his location. He was subsequently cleared from the missing persons database. Now, why would anyone want to join a cult and, well, throw away their lives for it? There are quite a few reasons. You see, cults often present themselves as welcoming communities, offering a sense of belonging, purpose, and answers to life's big questions. They may start with seemingly logical and attractive ideas, gradually evolving into more extreme beliefs and practices. The gradual shift often goes unnoticed by members. What's more, cults often use psychological techniques like love bombing, where new members are showered with attention and affection, making them feel special and valued. The combination of these methods can be powerful, leading individuals to accept and participate in activities that might seem illogical from an outside perspective. If you want to dig into a sinister rabbit hole, there are a lot of similar stories about cults on the internet. Fair warning, however, that some of these stories might keep you up at night, so proceed with caution. Number 5. Arthur Gerald Jones Arthur Gerald Jones, a Chicago commodities broker, mysteriously disappeared in 1979, leaving behind his wife and three children. His wife said that the last time she saw her husband was May 11, 1979, when he left for an errand. She noted he appeared highly nervous. He was declared legally dead in 1986. Yet, in 2011, Jones was discovered alive in Las Vegas, having lived under the alias Joseph Richard Sendelli for more than three decades. He had been working as a sportsbook writer at a casino. His discovery came about after Clifton Goodenough, whose social security number Jones had been using, initiated a thorough investigation to clear up financial irregularities linked to his identity. Authorities say before Jones disappeared, he paid a friend in Chicago $800 for fake documents and a social security number belonging to another man. He claimed he sought a fresh start and hadn't contacted family or friends in Illinois since his disappearance. Jones was arrested and faced charges related to identity theft and fraud. Living under a new identity to escape abusers? That's understandable, but assuming a new identity to avoid your responsibilities? Yeah, many believe he deserved that jail time. Number 4. Steve Stainer In 1972, at just seven years old, Stephen was kidnapped by Kenneth Parnell, a convicted criminal. Parnell, with the help of an accomplice, Urban Murphy, deceived Stephen by posing as a church worker. They lured him into their car under the pretext of taking him home, but instead took him to a remote cabin near Cathy's Valley, California. Parnell then proceeded to abuse Stephen and manipulate him into believing that his parents had relinquished custody because they couldn't afford to raise him. Stephen, now called Dennis Gregory Parnell, was enrolled in school and moved around with Parnell, living under this new identity. Despite the abuse, Stephen was given some freedoms uncommon in kidnapping situations. He had a pet dog and was allowed to smoke and drink at a young age. Parnell's manipulation was so effective that Stephen, Unsure of how to escape or return to a family he believed had abandoned him, tried to adapt to his new life. Refuge and freedom came in a bizarre way to Steve. Parnell decided to kidnap another young boy, Timothy White, in 1980. 
Stephen, recognizing the horror of the situation and recalling his own experiences, decided to act. He helped Timothy escape Parnell's cabin and hitched over 40 miles back to Ukiah, California, Timothy's hometown. At that point, they reported the incident to the police, finally exposing the horrifying acts committed by Parnell. Number 3. Gabriel Nagy Gabriel Nagy, a married father of two from Sydney, Australia, mysteriously disappeared on January 21, 1987. His car was found burnt on the side of a road, but there was no trace of him. This baffling disappearance left his family in despair and without any answers for many years. With a severe case of amnesia, Nagy had no way to identify himself. He lived under a pseudonym for a long time, with little recollection of his past life. He led a challenging existence, taking odd jobs and at times living on the streets. During his journey, he worked on farms, fishing boats, and construction sites across Queensland. Despite his difficult circumstances, a glimmer of hope appeared when he met Pastor Barry Hayhoe, who offered him shelter and a job as a caretaker at the River of Life Church. The turning point in Gabriel's story came when a Medicare record in his real name was discovered by Senior Constable Georgia Robinson, who had been investigating his case. This discovery prompted Gabriel to reconnect with his past. He wrote a heartfelt seven-page letter to his family, and soon after, he received a touching message from his daughter, Jennifer. Despite the emotional reunion and the joy of reconnecting with his family, Gabriel's amnesia meant that he could not fully remember his life before or his family, preventing him well, from- At least it's something, though. At least it's something. That's, that's, that's another fear of mine right there, bro. Amnesia? Away from your family? And then you come back and you still don't remember them? So it's this nervousness, a little bit of apprehension there, but you have some kind of a feeling? That's just, man, I, hey, bro, I hope his, his memory comes back fully one day. That's all you can ever do is hope. Because one day he could just wake up and it all just comes back. All those mem memories just come flooding back to him. Moving back in with him. However, he vowed to maintain contact and stay in touch. Number 2. Andreas Grassel In April 2005, a thoroughly drenched man was discovered alone on an English beach distinctly out of place in a suit and tie. He didn't speak a word and only communicated by playing the piano and drawing. The media went into a frenzy, calling him the Piano Man. For four long months, no one knew who he was. It was Sound a, like a time traveler to me. Long time before his identity was revealed. He was Andreas Grassel, a 20-year-old from Bavaria, Germany. He had traveled to Britain after losing his job in Paris. Luckily, Grassel was identified and later reunited with his family, who missed him dearly. And now it's time for today's topic. This boy vanished almost 10 years ago. Now, the FBI have discovered the strange truth. Timothy Pitson's case is a compelling mystery that captured national attention. Nearly a decade ago, Timothy, then six years old, vanished after his mother, Amy Fry Pitson, took him out of school in Illinois for a three-day trip. Tragically, Amy was later found deceased in a hotel room, having left a note stating that Timothy was safe but would never be found. Despite extensive searches and investigations, Timothy's whereabouts remain unknown for years. The case took a bizarre turn when a young man claimed to be Timothy, but DNA tests later disproved this claim, which means to this day, we're unsure about Timothy's fate. Foul play? Or something more sinister? Perhaps we'll never know. Number 1. Amanda Eller In May 2019, Amanda Eller, a 35-year-old physical therapist, set out for a short hike. However, she lost her way and survived in a dense forest for 17 days. The community rallied to find her, with search parties scouring the forest. Against all odds, she was discovered by a helicopter pilot and ground search volunteers. Amanda survived on stream water and what the forest provided, enduring a challenging ordeal. 